The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. Oh, yeah! This is the Cigar Authority. Have uh, you any imported cigars? The authority on everything cigar, in and out of the cigar industry. It's time to light them up. Smoke if you got them. It's time for the Cigar Authority. I got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowboy. Light them up, light them up, light them up, everybody. Saturday, October 12, 2019, live from the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is episode 496 as we continue the countdown to episode 500. Today, we go way back to 1993 when I first read The Ultimate Cigar Book. And today, there is a fourth edition, and we'll bring on the author, Richard Carlton Hacker, to talk about the differences of then and now. Welcome, everybody, to the Cigar Authority. And you're listening to the Cigar Authority, now in its 10th year, making it the longest continually running cigar podcast. Awarded the Ambassadors of Cigars by Cigar Journal Magazine. Awarded the Top 10 Educational Podcast by Podbean four years in a row. The Cigar Authority is the most listened to cigar podcast in the world. Cigar Radio at its finest, the Cigar Authority is a proud member of the United Podcast Network. And you catch the podcast on demand at any time or our daily blog at thecigarauthority.com. So I'm thinking to myself as we're preparing for this show, what cigar should we smoke during the show? Something to go back into those days of the cigar boom. And uh, Mike Damari, wherever you are, he uh, got my personal humidor and he, he says, it's a mess in here. I want to clean it up. And he went up and cleaned up the thing and he says you got some unbelievable stuff that's in here and it was nice because i hadn't seen a lot of it in a long time because it's all, it all buried in. in there and um there was actually a couple of boxes of these and um this is the cigar we're going to smoke barry i'll um, let you tell us about this well we're going to smoke the house of windsor and uh, it's a 5 by 43 called the sportsman it features a double claro wrapper from honduras homogenized binders and short fillers. That's all we know. All right. So this is from 1979, okay, for the 1980 Olympics. So I'm going back a long time ago. The lid is broken off on this, but I got a box of 50 here. And they were the official sponsor of the 1980 Winter Olympics, House of Windsor Sportsman. This was the cigar that was the sponsor. And not only did they have a cigar that was the sponsor of the Winter Olympics, they had a pipe. Dr. Grable was the official pipe of the 1980 Olympics. Can you imagine that today? No way, right? No way. Not at all. No way. So uh, I put them aside, and um, here they are literally 30 years later. 40. 40? 40 years. Oh, my God, am I old? So there were two years. miracles that year. Yes. The U.S. wins the uh, gold medal, and a box of cigars survived. Yes. I actually have two. I have a totally sealed box of these. Uh, I have a whole rack of pipes. A rack meaning, I think there were six that Dr. Grables came onto these cardboard things, and like six pipes uh, are on there, and um, two boxes, one sealed, and one actually for today for us to uh, light up and smoke along. So it is a machine-made cigar. And back in 1980, this was a good cigar as far as I was concerned. Um, Ed, we, we talked about that in a uh, last show, or the show before right. that, of Garcia Vega. Yeah, I mean, that, I noticed it's very similar. Absolutely. So what you do is you actually pull the cigar band end, which takes the cellophane off at the same time. And now there's no band on it because that's that was the pull tab, basically. How did you do that, Barry? Uh, I uh, ripped the cellar from the seam. Mm -hmm. And then I slid the oh, cigar out so I could have the band. I've never done that before. So, as you can see on it, there's a hole in the cigar. Yes. And people will look at that hole and say, oh, it's so you don't have to cut the cigar. This is where the rod was placed in to actually make it. They don't make put the hole in there, but it's for the rod of the machinery that ended up putting on here. So you can cut the cigar. You don't have to. But you, you can cut the cigar. Claro, this is green. Yeah, or at least it was when it came out. Right, <laughs> right. Um, so the question is, a Candela wrapper does turn a little bit more brown over time. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't, uh, or who knows in that day, if it was that bright 
of of a green at the time, but it is a Candela, which was popular. Um, this was the tail end of popularity, and I want to get to Richard Hacker on that. Uh, he probably know more than than uh, he uh, he knows more than me about cigars, but he also is older than me too. So maybe he's going to remember that, and we'll get to him. I hate to but, say it, but the cold draw on the cigar tastes like low tide at Coney Island. Long time, really? Low tide, low <laughs> tide. <laughs> All right, so let's give the cigar a cut and light. The official cutting brought to you by Perdomo Cigars. Perdomo, the brand, while all other brands were raising prices, Perdomo cut out the federal S-chip tax and actually lowered them. Perdomo Cigars, they stand for quality, tradition, and excellence. Excellence. So I'm going to give this a cut. And we have a, uh, we have a studio audience here today. So I'm going to put this box over here, Gary. If you would, give everybody one of these cigars. I know it's illegal to give away cigars, but I got that 40 years ago, so the law wasn't in effect at that time. <laughs> this, this is a 40-year-old House of Windsor double claro. Um, and, yeah, it's... it's um, Low tide. It's seaweed. Yes. It tastes like seaweed. It does. <laughs> All right. Now... What do you got? We're going to light our cigar today with the Vertigo Puffer. The Vertigo Puffer features a single soft flame that pokes out of the side, specially designed for a pipe lighter or pipes, although you can light a cigar with it. And you've got your tools built in. You've got your scraper, your poker, and your tamper, all in a Swiss Army style setup that tucks right into the body of the lighter. This lighter retails for $19.99. It's the Vertigo Puffer. Puffer, asked for by name. And this is out of respect for Richard Carlton Hack, who was Correct. coming on the show, that we will end up uh, talking about not only his ultimate cigar book, but the ultimate pipe book, his, his liquor book, and all that stuff. So uh, let's get to him. Um, with us, the author of The Cigar Book, which is correctly titled The Ultimate Cigar Book. Welcome to the Cigar Authority, Richard Carlton Hack. Are you there? Hey, thank you, Dave. And, uh, Hi, everybody. And just at that moment, my big picture on my screen went out. Now I have a little tiny picture of you guys, but nothing else. So I don't know what went on there, Ed. Maybe you can well, Richard, put a quote. They're really not worth seeing. So I think we're all good. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to see us, but we can see you. And that's all that matters. Yeah. Loud but I like you. seeing me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just put a mirror next to the screen and you're all set. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm dragging this little tiny picture of you guys over. I don't know what I would like. All right. Whatever. Um, so, yeah, we um, I um, got your book as soon as it came out. I, I've been in the cigar business since 1985. I've been smoking right. cigars since since 80, uh, maybe 78, I think. And um, when I got it, um, the, the cigar boom had just begun. And um, I learned so much from it that it became actually mandatory reading for every employee that came in that I said, okay, here it is all done for us. This is what we're going by. And, you know, there was, there was a couple before you. Right. And um, yours was the one that I agreed upon. You know, you can pick apart many, many things in, in everybody's thing, and, you know, everybody has their theories of, of what it is. But I looked at that, and I said, this is it, and this will become the Bible of Two Guys Smoke Shop. And uh, it has. And as, and as I said before, I don't have it here on our desk in front of us. I have the ultimate pipe book that's here. The ultimate cigar book, was, which was ep, um, the, the first one, um, I had let people borrow so many times. And it, <laughs> it's gone again. And it will return. It always returns. But it's gone. And um, uh, that becomes it. I just wait for it to, to come back. Um, well, that, that's what happens, Dave. And... Uh, Back in the early years when that first edition came out, that was the four-color cover. And uh, there, as you said, there hadn't been anything like that out there. And the reason I wrote it was because there was nothing out there that I wanted to read and learn. And so I began writing the book I always wanted. But, nice. uh, you know, just FYI, this is what it looks like now. now I can't see it because my screen yeah is, you know i have this but it, it, it kind of looks like this hold so, it up just a little bit higher and we'll be able to see the, the whole thing there perfect. we go perfect perfect okay. yep. yeah and, and my favorite part is that the back cover and, and nobody knows this this is a uh it, it's a um, gin martini made with nola gin taken in holland this picture they, you know they dropped it out of the background and i'm smoking a monte number two monte Cristo number two 
with uh, Carl Nolet, one of the family, you know, he's 11th generation. And uh, it's not really a plug for them. It's just that no one knows, oh, what a great looking picture. But there's a story behind it. We were smoking cigars. I laid my cigar on my drink, took a shot. And when we're doing the book, they said, oh, the, we got to put, let's put a whole bunch of things about you on the back. I said, no, not about me. I said, let's do a cigar thing. And so... I sent him that picture, and that's how that happened. Ah. I digressed. <laughs> oh, well, no, it's good having a little uh, inside uh, information of what happened. So you were a cigar smoker. You were a pipe smoker. You were a drinker. Um, <laughs> and um, you saw the void of information. And th- let me tell you, we, we, it's almost 10 years here for the Cigar Authority. The same reason why we started the Cigar Authority was the void of information. And when it comes right. to liquor, when it comes to wine and things like that, there's so much information, there's so many tastings and classes and things like that. But when it, when it comes to cigars, there's a lack of information and the information that's out there, so much of it is actually wrong. Absolutely and, right, and yeah. So, you know, it's like, okay, let me let me do my part for an industry that was very good to me and try to provide proper information. But that's what I got from the Ultimate Cigar Book, that I'm like, finally, there's something out there that's, that's giving the correct information. And for no other purpose, you, you didn't have a cigar to sell. You, you were not no. in, the, in, in the business. So there was nothing other than your love of cigars and say, okay, this is the information I figured out. Is that, is that pretty much it? That's that's right on, and you said two things that are pretty imperative, uh, Dave. One, uh, not all the information out there was or is correct, because uh, nowadays, you know, back then there, there was no internet. I couldn't go to the internet and find out about these brands. I had to go physically to the country, talk to the people, and talk to the manufacturers and get it all firsthand. So that was from there, and. Uh, uh, I forgot the other thing you said. Something else. What was the other? You made another really good point about uh, oh the the book um, that I like. I said before it was the book I always wanted and never had. And when I wrote it before I shipped it off to be published, I reread it and said, "What haven't I answered? What didn't I do? Oh, I didn't talk about the cellophane." So I put a section in there about the cello. You know, how do you take it off? Why is it there? And you know, things like that. Yeah. And so, as, as the years went on and the editions changed, it was more added to it? Yes. Every edition, including this current one, which is the fourth printing of the fourth edition, I still added stuff. I mean, you know, in the third printing of the fourth edition, Castro had the nerve to die. So, <laughs> I, had to, so I had to change that. You know, I had to update that. And, uh, of course, the, the hardest chapter to keep up with is the uh, last one, the International Compendium of cigar brands, because as you know, there's new brands coming out right. daily, every, you can't keep up with it. And other, other brands are, are, you know, sadly going away and some not so sadly, but uh, uh, it's just changing. And the, the whole FDA thing, no one knows what they're going to do. So a lot of companies aren't coming out with new cigars where other companies are saying, let's give it one quick shot while we can. So yeah, that's, that's always evolving. Every issue I can guarantee you there'll be something new. Is there something in the first issue that you looked at and said, okay, this is going to go? Um, not really. No? Not re- no, no. Everything in there was uh, pretty much what I wanted. I had to tweak a lot of things. Um, you know, no, nobody was talking about uh, the, the upper primings. They were just talking about Volado, Seco, and Hero. Yeah. And they really didn't get into the upper primings and what that does to flavor. And so I... I, you know, capitalized and added more on that. So I actually expanded a lot of information, and I, and I still am. Because, you know, the one thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, people say, ah, oh, you're an expert. I'm, no, I'm not an expert. An, an expert knows it all. I don't know it all. I'm, I'm learning something every day. Something new happens. I discover something, and I'm constantly revising my uh, no, now I've got them on computer. I'm always revising my notes. I have a little section said for the next edition. So for the next printing, I've got a whole bunch of things to send to the uh, publisher who's going to go, oh my God, again? But yeah, yeah you got to do that. Richard, many people have given you credit for kicking off and if not actually making the cigar boom start, certainly adding to the momentum. But how many years did it take you to write the book? And while you were doing your research, 
did you see an indication in those countries that you were visiting that the boom was coming? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you can say I began writing my book the first time I fired up a decent cigar <laughs> because that's when I began formulating a lot of my opinions uh, about cigar smoking, what it is, what it should be, what I thought it was, um, which was wrong and because it became a part of my life. And then uh, as uh, I, I, I've always been a writer. I've been published since I was uh, 17 years old. I won the grand prize of the Boys Life National Writing Contest um, when I was 17 then. And that's uh, with the Western, believe it or not, called The Cowboy and the Steer. I think I, I, 19, uh, I wanted to give the year, a long time ago. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have electricity. I think Gutenberg printed it. Yeah. Uh, it's a long time ago. But uh, yeah, as... I got into cigar smoking. I began seeing a change, one, in the cigars. Uh, there were, you know, there's more um, Lonsdale shapes, if you will, more Corona shapes, if you will. Not so much the double perfectos that they used to, you know, have and be popular back in the uh, 30s and 50s. Plus, more importantly, I saw the cigar smoker was changing. They were more like I was back then. Younger guys smoking a stogie just to socialize and to relax. And the big, you know, double chin guy in the huge car, you're slobbering on a cigar, you know, and it's like a rain gutter. And that's, that was gone. And yeah. now you got these young people. And I remember in 1989, I wrote an article. I was writing for Playboy of it. And I wrote an article called Up in Smoke. And that was about what I had observed as a cigar smoker. Because, you know, Playboy back then, especially, even though they had these pictures, uh, a lot of people didn't read it for the had pictures. I, I, I never looked at the pictures in there at all. I didn't know they had articles. No, really? <laughs> <laughs> you can see who's who here. But I'll tell you how sick I was back then, because like I said, I'm a professional writer. That's what I do for my living. I would get my comp copy of Playboy each month, and the first thing I'd go to, not the centerfold, I'd go to my article. Yeah, right, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and so, anyways, I wrote this. This was the first uh, major cigar piece I did called Up in Smoke. And What I year was that? Uh, 1989. Wow, okay. 89, before the boom. Before and I got so much mail, so much mail. That's what really told me I was on to something, and that's when I began – going to all these third world countries. I began uh, uh, meeting uh, you know, people like Benjamin Endes and uh, Sid Fuentes and, uh, and Carlito Fuente I'd known for years before this, wow. uh, him since the 70s. So uh, we were both little tiny babies, you know. Uh, and I just started doing really intense research roughly from uh, 89 up until the book came out when 93 – because I finished it in the end of 92. Uh, and even then, I, I could go on and on and on, but, but I got to get the book out there. Talk about timing, though. Oh, my God, because it was the launch of Cigar Aficionado in 92, and the boom, right. uh, I, I would say the boom started about in 1990. As, as a retailer, I could see the changes that was happening. Sure. As you say, the, the younger people getting into it and um, you know just tracking numbers, that uh, the volume was up and the new brands coming out and everything was going, was happening. And, and the timing of it, of... Um, that whole thing, and then all of a sudden the book comes out, and I remember looking at it, and I go, well, somebody's on top of their game right here, and that was you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we, uh, you know, we didn't know how it would do, but uh, th that first edition sold out in uh, three weeks. Wow. And the publishers said, wow, they'd never seen that. And there was a time, Dave, you know, during 93, 4, 5, I remember distinctly, we could not keep that book in print. It would go out as soon as it came off the press, and there's so much demand, and knock on wood, uh, it was great. And I was glad to, to, to be able to disseminate this information, but that just told me I really got to get my act, you know, everything's got to be totally correct, and I can't miss anything, and that's why I keep on updating it, even though, I'm, oh, this is, this is good, this is good. I there's always something to add. There's something new you're going to learn. I remember going to the um, RTDA at, back in those days, and there you were set, set up in a booth, yep. and I'd, yep. bu I'd buy books for the store, and I'd put them on the counter, and 
the people would come in and say, oh, this is a book to teach me about it. Yes, boom, boom, boom. And we, we sold them. It's the only book I ever sold in 34 years I've been in the business, including my own book. He doesn't even I, sell I wrote his own a book. book. It's the only book I ever sold in the store. I believe in it, and, and it's as accurate as accurate can be. Uh, I've never written a cigar book because you already did it. Well, you were one of the front runners, and my wife and I were talking about this. Cause I said, oh, I'm going to be interviewed by, <clears throat> by Dave. Two Guys Cigar Shop, and she says, oh, they were so great. I remember them because um, when this book first came out, most people don't know this, I couldn't find anybody to to publish it. So I actually took a second mortgage out on my house, and I published the first two editions myself. Wow. So, you know, taking a big financial risk. Sure. I, think I, I just believed in it. But it, it was guys like you, um, Ewan Reese, a couple others I re- who said, we're going to sell this because this helps. Uh, there's a lot of res- uh, resistance within the community, i got to say. But, and you've heard, the, I'm a tobacconist, I'm not a bookseller. And I said, but this book helps you sell your product. But it was a tough sell, but nonetheless, the, what I did was I did a lot of talk shows. I was on Letterman, I, did, I was on radio. We didn't have podcasts back then. Um, and I just built up so much, if you will, awareness that this book was out there. I knew the cigar smokers were out there. But I, I built up, because uh, my background was in marketing, so I built up the consumer awareness. So now we had people coming and said, do you have the book? And if they were, you know, forward-thinking uh, tobacconists like, like you guys were, uh, they had it. And if they didn't, they said no. And, you know, of course, you couldn't. There's no Amazon there. Right, that's right. There's none of this. You know, we don't you know, get it today. The millennials don't get it. None of this stuff existed. So these people, the cigar smokers would go from shop to shop to shop till they found it. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and I finally got, you know, people to sell the book and distributors, but yeah, you're right. We were, we sold ourselves for many years. Yeah. I made my employees read it. And then after they read it, there was a quiz that I would quiz them on the book, basically, to make sure they had the information. And I said, listen, this is, as far as I know, the best information uh, that I've seen, and this is what we're going to go by so that we're all on the same page, because customers ask the same questions over and over, and it's so crazy when they go to one place or they go to one uh employee and ask the question and they get one answer and another person the other answer so i said here's the i want to know what the answer is and if you dispute it let's talk about it and and try to say why this is the answer and and try you know at least so we're all on the same page to make the argument nobody argued everybody took it as the bible it is and said okay this is the information as we know it and um it's uh, to, to my listener that's out there, uh, if you're looking for the real deal, and I know it's so easy to, to Google stuff and look at it, but it's the information as I Google the stuff, I, I just shake my head and I'm like, oh my God, this is totally wrong. And it's out there like it's yeah. the truth. And, um, you know, you've t- you talked to the people, you talked to the farmers, you talked to the cigar makers, and you got the real inside information. It's, it's like when I went to Cuba and I came back and I, I did a whole show on my trip to Cuba and, and wrote sure. uh, um, a seven-day thing on it. And everybody came back to me and said, that's not true. And I said, I saw <laughs> it. I'm not <laughs> lying. It's my, my, my eyes. This is the truth. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not right. <laughs> I was there. Yeah, and then they weren't. You know, I said, go there and come back and have the <laughs> argument with me. But you, you can't not go and tell me what I didn't see. Richard, exactly. at, at some yeah. point in the, the, the late 90s, cigars seemed to have started to get stronger. Certainly the one we're smoking now is so mild, it's, it's bordering on flavorless. At what point would you say cigars started using those higher primings on the tobacco to get stronger? Um, probably right around 94, because everybody's, everybody's smoking everything. You know, they, they're coming off of the House of Windsor, if you will. Uh, I mean, I began smoking uh, my first big, the first little cigar I smoked was a Robert Burns. I remember ah. that. To 10 cents a piece. Um, and overpriced at that. Yeah. Uh, I probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> but uh, then uh, I went to uh, ANC, Anthony and Cleopatra, sure. with a Candela, Candela wrapper. And that was, whoa, you had to look at the smoke to see if it was lit because it was, it was so <laughs> mild. And as the boom started moving on, and uh, I have to say, as my book 
had that chapter on, on tobacco and, and Maduro and what it does and the EMS and AMS, all that stuff. People began experimenting and they wanted more flavors. Um, it's a parallel to whiskey in a way. Um, back in the 30s, people were drinking blended scotch because it was blended to tone it down. And then, and before that, the guys working in the distillery were drinking single malts which was what a blend is made of, but the single malt was not toned down. It was a rock of a sock in your face drink. And after the 50s, we got into the 60s, they started drinking. Then they discovered single malt, and that became popular because it's stronger. Same thing happened with cigars. You're smoking. Got anything stronger? You know, and, and Dave, I know you must have heard this a hundred times from somebody in your store. You got anything stronger? And so that started really getting serious around 94, 95. And, uh, of course, when Fuente came out with the Opus X, that was a real, uh, just a meaty cigar without saying, "Oh my God, I can't, I can't smoke this." It was just a wonderful meaty cigar. That, but that whole thing just evolved, you know, from I'd say to the mid '90s up, and it's still going. You know, we had a brief spat, I think, right around the turn of this this century. People went to mild again. Oh, you want a mild cigar? Uh, didn't last long. So everybody now wants medium to medium mild. And I say everybody. I'm using that as a generality. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Obviously, no, some people don't. It's true. We see the t- p- pendulum switching over size-wise. You know, yeah. whoever thought that 60 ring gauges would be a normal type thing when, when we're smoking uh, 40 ring gauges, uh, corona type things, and uh, mm-hmm. it's dramatic what happened. What are we smoking? We're, sm- we're smoking the uh, House of Windsor from 1980 from the Olympic version. This is a 43, Barry, maybe? This is a, uh, a 5 by 43. Yeah, 43. Which in 1980 was was a average like, cigar. Uh, sure. Here in my store right now, there isn't a dozen cigars I have in here that would be this ring gauge. Not even. Yeah. Not not yeah. even. So things have changed, and I want to get into that with you. We're going to go to break, and when I come back, I saw a first edition of the Ultimate Cigar Book on Amazon. It's signed, and it's for nine hundred nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents. I have the I first see. edition, but I don't have it signed. And I'm wondering if Richard Hacker will sign it, and all of a sudden I got $1,000 here. We'll talk about that. Mr. Hacker didn't uh, uh, buy Playboy magazines for the pitches. He bought it for the articles, and he, he briefly taught, t- taught about that. We'll talk a little about pipes. We'll talk a little, little about booze and lots more. We're live in the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, and you're listening to The Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. To some, tradition is a catchphrase. To us, it's a guiding light. For there can be no great future without reverence for the past. Hammer and Sickle Tradition Series cigars are handmade, employing only time-honored methods. Meticulously crafted of individually selected tobaccos, Tradition Series is a blend of three-year-aged Dominican Viso and Lijero, all finished inside a breathtaking five-year-aged Connecticut shade wrapper. Tradition Series from Hammer and Sickle. Live well. Romeo San Andreas by Romeo y Julieta. The Romeo y Julieta love story with a bold and modern twist. America's favorite love story takes on a modern zeal with this A.J. Fernandez collaboration. Romeo San Andreas by Romeo y Julieta, crafted in Esteli, Nicaragua, is a contemporary take on the rich and robust profile of the Romeo by Romeo collection. This exceptional premium offering employs an aged San Andreas wrapper considered one of the most flavorful leaves used in today's premium cigar market. Handcrafted in Nicaragua by cigar master A.J. Fernandez. Full flavored, dressed in a stunning San Andreas wrapper. Rich and bold profile with notes of dark chocolate, spice, and licorice. And available in four sizes, Robusto, Toro, Pyramid, and Short Magnum. Competitively priced under $10. Romeo San Andreas by Romeo y Julieta. The Romeo y Julieta love story with a bold and modern twist. 
It's an exquisite day here at the Jensen Estate patio overlooking the 13th green. And we're underway. Jim Jensen has chosen his favorite stick. The Diamond Crown Number 4 by J.C. Newman. See the way he holds the cigar, Tom? Mm-hmm. Excellent balance and heft. Ooh, he's eyeing the Silky Connecticut Shade Wrapper. Fermented twice for the smoothest, richest flavor. And hand-rolled by the Fuente family with a blend of six to seven distinct Dominican and Caribbean basin tobacco leaves. Each lovingly aged for at least five years. Oh, now Jensen's lighting up the Diamond Crown. He's got a precision burn, Tom. Mm, those highly complex flavors with hints of dark chocolate really deliver, Bill. Yes, like all cigars in J.C. Newman's premium diamond crown line. That'd be the highly rated Maximus and the Julius Caesar. Ah, now Jensen's settling in, rolling the rich smoke through his nose. Look at the satisfaction on his face, Bill. Oh, a thing of beauty, Tom. Experience the premium diamond crown brand by J.C. Newman at select retailers or diamond crown lounge near you. Find us on Facebook at J.C. Newman Cigar Co. or visit at diamondcrown.com. I want to talk to you today about my friend Glenn Case from Christoph Cigars. I've known him for many years. Glenn is a very nice guy, one of the nicest guys in the industry. Always friendly, always happy. So when I heard his brand Christoph was pissed off, I was surprised. Christoph Cigars have always been known as smooth and rich, and the pissed off Christoph is just that. But there's something else happening here. A natural San Andreas wrapper, the binder, Indonesian, and the filler, Nicaraguan. And like Glenn Case, the cigar starts off sweet, but then it gets pissed off. And like Bruce Banner, you don't want to piss off Glenn Case about Kristoff cigars. Or do you? Expect some spins and a nicotine kick. Strap yourself in for a ride. Pissed off Kristoff is deceivingly strong. You've been warned. Sold in 10-count boxes, four sizes including Churchill, 6x60, Robusto, and Corona Gorda. The hottest new brand is the Pissed Off Kristoff. Take it for a ride. Since 1964, Padron Cigars have had the same mission. With over 50 years spent to create a perfect cigar, and more than 100 years to create a perfect legacy, the Padron family understands the significance of time. Padron delivers only the finest handmade complex cigars with the flavor of the Cuban heritage, out of which the Padron recipe was born. The Padron mission is simple, exceptional quality of their cigars and not the quantity produced. As a vertically integrated family-owned company, personal attention to every detail is taken in all steps of the tobacco growing and cigar making process. Padron Cigars, they give you, the cigar smoker, the confidence that each cigar is the same. Perfect. Padron Cigars, handcrafted since 1964. I want to tell you about my friend Hochi Blanco, a fourth generation Dominican cigar maker known for growing tobacco and producing highly acclaimed cigars for other people. If some things stay the same, other things have to change. Finally, Hochi's factory, Tobacalera Palmer, has produced a cigar that not only belongs to the factory, but pays homage to the cigar rolling room known as La Galera. The La Galera Connecticut blend is special, using an Ecuadorian Connecticut wrapper surrounding a Dominican blend of Peloto Cubano, Criollo 98, and a varietal that Hochi named T112. With the exception of the wrapper, Hochi grows all of the La Galera tobaccos himself and carefully watches over every step. The flavor is smooth, but still offering plenty of flavor in all sizes, paying homage to the people and tools used in the factory. Now for the amazing part. La Galera, Connecticut has a suggested retail price ranging from $4.95 to $6 and has been awarded the Cigar of the Year by the Cigar Authority. La Galera, Connecticut, creating their own version of the Connecticut cigar because they demand more. This is Christian Eroa from CLE, Asylum, and Eroa. You're listening to the Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. And we're back, and we're going back in time with cigar brands, and with us is the author of the Ultimate Cigar Book, now in its fourth edition, Richard Hacker. Welcome back. Great to be back. Okay. Um, I just, uh, yeah? I, oh, I, just, I just sent Ed a quick uh, phone message. I don't know if I can get my picture back. If not, I'll wing it. But I can see you guys, your little teeny tiny things, yeah. and uh, I can't see 
what I really don't want to see, but I want to see myself to make sure that I don't have my you know spinach in my teeth or anything. Can't do <laughs> Looking it. good I'll, to me. I, I'll let you know. I'll let you know right away. Yeah, Every, I'll see. I'll wing it. I'll wing it. I'll everything see. looks perfect. You can watch. You can watch this mess after the show is over. Again, <laughs> just go to YouTube or Facebook or whatever, and uh, you, you'll see that. Or so, Richard. One of the many cigar shops that listen to our show, they're asking if you think that there will ever be another cigar boom like in the mid '90s again. That's a really, really good question. Uh, of course, we all hope there would be. Uh, well, some some people don't. Like manufacturers couldn't keep up with it. They ran out of tobacco. But um, sadly, no. I don't think it'll be to that extent because we have so many anti-smoking laws now that make it difficult to do what we did back then. The smokers. I mean. I was going to smokers as a speaker uh, at least three times a week during the boom. Wow. I don't see that happening. And but yeah, well, just as a, as a side note, I had two different tuxedos because they were all black tie. So I'd get off the plane, come home, take my suitcase out. My wife wouldn't touch them. She had a long pole. Oh, and she would God, yeah. <laughs> take these poles and, and dump them in these laundry bags. And th- that would go after the dry cleaners while... The next day, I packed my other tuxedo and take off. And when I came back, the first one had come back. So we did that around Robin. But anyhow, um, I, I don't see that happening. Smokers are going on, of course. Thank God, there's shops like you know, uh, you know, the two guys. There's shops that have smoking. You know, the, the, the day they say you can't smoke in a tobacco shop will be the day the whole world collapses. Yeah, but it's over. I think it will continue it will never stop uh the camaraderie the cigar smoking uh, that will go on as long as there are human beings who appreciate life um but it'll be on a lesser degree there are cigar dinners um there certainly are cigar fests um but i don't think it'll be to the massive extent that we did see before although cigar having said that cigar sales as you know are, are going up. They're yeah. not going up to three hundred percent they used to during the boom. That was insane. Yeah. You can't you can't keep that up. No. But yeah, they're going up every year. So I wonder if if the um Cuban embargo ends. That's how I envision the next boom to happen. Uh, going to Cuba five or six times that I went, I see old ladies and people that have nothing to do with cigars going into the cigar factories and buying cigars because, oh, let me grab some cigars while I'm here. Or the sure. only cigar they ever tried in their life was a Cuban cigar because the mystique and everything that goes along with it. Uh, if, if it happens in the U.S., I think there's going to be a whole bunch of non-cigar smokers that say, I want to try this. You're, you're absolutely right. There'll be a feeding frenzy is what's going to happen. Um, I think it will be short-lived. By that, I'm saying six to eight months because uh, Cuban cigars are typically more expensive than non-Cuban cigars. Sure. So you're going to be paying uh, whatever the price is. And I, you know, Cuba, I love the Cuban people. They're great. But the Cuban government... This is a money maker for them, and they are going to do the best uh, effort they can to get the most money they can. Sure. Listen, America is a really, really good market, and uh, well, we have been uh, cut out of that market for decades now. So they're going to charge more money. So you can spend as a consumer, say twenty-five to forty-five on up for a Havana cigar. Or you can spend, you know, as little as five bucks up to eight bucks, ten bucks for a really, really good Nicaraguan or Dominican. Well, people who aren't into cigars and even those who are, they're going to buy Cubans just to do it, to have it, because we haven't been able to do it for over 15 right, years. Right, right. Then, once they do that, well, well, that was great. Now, I think I'll buy, you know, a, a, a Fuente or I think I'll buy a, an Ashton for a lot less money and smoke that tonight after dinner. I think that's what's going to happen. It'll be a frenzy, and it'll die down. It'll sure. Die down. I, I believe so, too. So what was the first cigar uh, of a premium cigar that actually you got infatuated with cigar smoking at that point? It wasn't the Robert Burns, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> the opposite effect on yeah. me. <laughs> uh, no, I remember it. I did, it was an oil, oil de Monterey. Uh, made in Honduras. Okay. Frankie, Frankie in, in, was a great guy. He's passed away now. Great yeah. guy. And I knew him. I uh, 
I ended up going to the factory because of this cigar. Anyhow, I was still in college, and uh, the embargo was, you know, on. You know, the embargo was in 63, so this is after that. And I was in school, and I obviously got really tired of the ANCs right away. Yeah. And it got to be something else. And I walked into a tobacco shop, and I don't remember which one it was, to be honest with you. Probably one of the ones on Wilshire Boulevard that isn't there anymore. And <laughs> I uh, was inside and I said, uh, what do you have? It's like a medium thing. And he showed me the stuff and I saw the box of oil to monitor rays and on the lid, it said made with real Havana tobacco. Mm. Well, well, what had, what had happened, Frank had stored a bunch of Cuban tobacco before the embargo because they all saw it coming. Sure. Uh, and uh, he would take a leaf of this Cuban tobacco and put it in the filler blend. So that's that's all there was in there. It right. was, was Honduran tobacco, but there was this leaf of of pure Havana in there, and so I so I bought a cigar. Yeah. That's all I could afford, and I took it out and I smoked it outside, and because you could do that then too, <laughs> nobody would say anything. And uh, wow, this is just like. You turn, you know, it's a cliche. You turn on a light bulb. Holy cow! This is what it's all about. And I just sat there and mind melded with that cigar. And I went back the next week. I bought another one, and then I bought a cheap one, machine made one. And then I went back, and then I formed my philosophy. Then, which I still, I still adhere to today. I would rather smoke one good cigar a week than seven mediocre cigars a week. Yeah. And that's what I do. And now, luckily, I'm in a better position, uh, as I hope we all are. I smoke good cigars every day. Yeah. And it's a question of which good cigar do I want to smoke today? Yeah. That was Zeno Davidoff. Smoke less, but smoke better, right? Right on. Yeah. Richard, you um, you obviously you do a lot with the whiskeys and the pipe tobaccos and the cigars. Do you ever pull... Uh, odd flavors out. For example, I'm getting right now, uh, if you toasted Wonder Bread, you got a Wonder Bread toast, medium toast, and you dip that in a spicy milk concoction that's about an hour from spoiling. That's what I have <laughs> on this House of Windsor Sportsman from 1980. Yeah, the cigar did not... Uh, <laughs> A, age very well after forty years of uh, it, it was a, it was a cheap cigar to begin with, yeah. and now I have an old cheap cigar. But do you get well, do you do you pull flavor components out of uh, out of the smoke? Oh, absolutely! I don't I don't have it here, but I have a a, a big thick book that used to be full of uh, blank pages, and I bought it because it had blank pages, uh, and I keep a daily uh, you know record of all the things that I smoke. And yeah, my my. Flavor profiles have changed over the years. I remember when uh, Cigar Aficionado first came out with the flavors on cigars. This, this I got to say, they were the first. This hadn't been done before. Um, I would use the HPH, the Highly Prejudice Hacker Scale, to judge them on strength. I never did a flavor profile on it. Uh, and Marvin had his guys pull things out like strawberries and uh, lettuce leaf and stuff. And I remember talking to Benjamin Menendez about this. And, you know, he's one of the old timers. You know, he's a uh, second generation, Monte you know, Christo. American from yeah. Cuba. Yeah. His family is we're tobacconists and the tobacco growers. We're sitting there talking. He says, you know, Richard, I've never gotten banana. He says, I've never gotten kumquat. I don't know where these guys are coming from. But I figured out where they're coming from was the people who were initially profiling cigars for Cigar Aficionado were the same guys doing wines for the Wine Spectator, because Marvin owns them both. Yeah. So the only reference they had was organic things, uh, flavors. And that set a trend. And I got to say... I started looking for things like that. Like I remember uh, 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 tasting champagne with one of the, uh, the champagne makers. And I said, you know what? I'm getting pineapple out of here. And he said, I've never gotten pineapple. And he tasted it. He said, wait a minute. He says, you're right. There's pineapple in there. And I said, where's that coming from? Because they're only using two basic grapes in this grand champagne. And he said, that means age. It's very indicative of age. He said, this is an old champagne. Wow. That, so now his corporate tasting notes include pineapple. For that ah, particular that's image. awesome. 
<laughs> but I started looking for it. So yes, as I smoke cigars, I, I'm doing them more and more. I've got to say, it's a much more difficult task to get different flavors. I'll, I'll get sweetness before I get anything on a cigar. I get meatiness. Uh, I do get some burnt toast. Um, I do get some um, meat flavors, like I've often referred to cigars as a porterhouse kind of cigar, because it reminds me of that, not, not that, uh, that texture, but that strength that will stand up to a porterhouse steak. So, you know, I mean, there's much more variety in single malt whiskeys if you want to get down to it. But, yeah, in cigars, you can find that, but you have to look for it. Or you have to be really erudite like like Dave is there. Yeah. <laughs> or Ed, you know, Ed, Ed's finding bandages and things. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> So you, you do the same as you did for cigars, you did for pipes, and you did for liquor. Do you see, the, are they very connected to each other? It's almost the same type of thing? There are similar flavors that you'll come across, um, mainly the burnt toast, uh, toasted oak, that kind of thing. You'll, that kind of does a spectrum. But some things, uh, fruit flavors, for example, unless it's a flavored cigar, uh, which I hope you're not smoking, but uh, uh, you won't get fruit. I don't get fruit out of cigars, but I, I do get some veg vegetal flavors, absolutely. I, I do get lettuce sometimes, uh, and these are some things I also find in spirits and uh, more so in wine. Have you ever gotten Chinese pea pods? That's basically <laughs> lettuce, Baron. <laughs> yeah, it's the same friggin' thing. <laughs> Try to follow along. So someone yeah. in our audience uh, noted that the October 1989 Pamela Anderson edition of Playboy is where your article was uh, and talk about before, before the boom um, started the boom. It could be the early beginning of the boom, that article itself. I forgot about Pamela Anderson. How could I do that? Well, she, was on, she was the cover girl on that, on that I issue. He really it, does just go to his article. He's it's not true. even, <laughs> he was busy smoking a cigar during the photo shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Well, the first edition of the Ultimate Cigar Book I found on Amazon, somebody is selling a signed edition of it for $919.99. I should have kept some. Oh, know? my goodness. <laughs> um, as I say, I do have um, the first edition. I'm going to put it aside for the next time I see you so that I can, happy, I can get it. I, um, <laughs> I, I do have uh, this the pipe, pipe edition, and mm -hmm. I believe it is signed. Most of them are. In fact, the joke. Somewhere it's right in here. The industry yep. was the the really rare editions of the Ultimate Pipe Book were the ones that weren't signed. <laughs> <laughs> I signed so many of them. Um, so where does somebody find your book? Um, Amazon.com has got the best prices for the cigar book and for the spirits book. Um, or if you're lucky, as you can find them in a tobacco shop. Very few, I got to say, very few tobacco shops stock them now because they've got the internet. They people yes. go there, but uh, uh, you, you know, most of the bookstores will order it for you. Barnes and Noble stocks it, I'm sure. Uh, Walgreens yes. stocked it, but I, I know most people go to Amazon.com because I think they have free shipping and and they've got the lowest price that I've seen on it. So how about the people that read it on Kindle and stuff? Is there a Kindle edition of it also? Yes, there's there's a Kindle of both books, absolutely. Okay, and did you ever do a reading of the book? I never have. No, no, okay. no I never. That would be Somebody interesting. Else. How long you, is the I, event going to be? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> it's freaking no, eight hours. No, not the event, but you book on tape type of thing. An oh, audio right. book. Oh, An audio yeah, book. Yeah. There's the word ah, for it. Thank yeah. you. I have I'd love to do that. Yeah, if somebody and, wants to. Do and that, I'll tell you, you got the pipes for it too. I think it should be the author. You have a nice voice that. Um, you know, if I was having somebody do a commercial for two guys, and I would want your type of voice of... Um, it's got a good timber. Yeah. It, oh, it, it's, a good, it's a good cigar guy's voice. We right? need an audio book. I think an audio book. I'm all, I'm all for it. You guys put it together. I'll do it. Here we go. So I got a question for you about pairing. Uh, what's your preference? Bourbon, scotch, rum? Um. It depends on my mood and the season, but uh, my favorite drinks uh, of the spirits, summertime, like right now, I'm doing tequila. I love tequila, ah. especially, especially the Blanco. Yep. Uh, that's the purest form of agave. 
Um, then in the fall, I'll segue into bourbon, which was my first love. My first like real serious drink was Jim Beam. And uh, I'll go into bourbons. And then in the winter and into the, you know, after the first of the year, I'm, I'm in real heavily, heavily into uh, single malt scotch. And uh, my, I, you know, McCallum is my go-to, McCallum 18. But I love like, Ardbeg. The Ardbeg 10-year-old is really, really, really smoky. Very solid. Mm-hmm. And boy, that and a cube of ice and a fireplace and my wife beside me. And that's uh, that's. I don't need television. I mean, <laughs> right? that's, that's a great evening. And do you pair cigars with your liquor? Do you, is there anything of that going on? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, uh, almost every night, uh, late before I go to bed, I'll have a snifter of something and a cigar that obviously will go with it. So, yeah, and I've done seminars. In fact, during the boom, I did a lot of seminars for General Cigar and for Ritz Carlton uh, on pairing, <coughs> excuse me, whiskeys and cigars. And uh, that's an easy thing to do. You know, I mean, you know, Dominicans go with a, a, a lighter scotch, a Roland, uh, a blend, uh, in my opinion. Um, I'll take uh, Nicaraguans go really well with, um, you know, s- certain McAllen's, not all of them. They go really well with um Ard, well, they, you know, the, some will go with Ardbeg, but Hondurans go with Ardbeg or any of the Isla single malts much better. They're just nice and meaty and smoky, and they match up. And the trick is to get a cigar and a whiskey that complement each other. They go together. You don't want to get a light cigar and a heavy whiskey because <coughs> oh, the the it's going to trump the cigar. Yeah. yeah. So they got to they got to complement each other. All right. Do you, do you dabble in rums at all? Yep. Love rums. Okay. Yeah. I'm a Florida con, you guys. You, so. you and Barry will get along just fine. So you're you're yeah. recommending, as far as pairing goes, to go complementary versus oppositional. And I've Absolutely. seen I've yeah. seen people do seminars on both. Whereas yeah. uh, there's a cigar out there. Uh, what's the peat cured one? Kalanok. Kalanok. Where you really can't smoke a Kalanok with a peaty Scotch because the peat disappears almost on both. So you would have the Kalanok with something lighter, like a Macallan Twelve. Uh, mm-hmm. That's lighter and fruity, and then you can you can taste the peat. Yeah, peat is a whole different animal because it uh, it is so strong. Well, it, that's that's a blanket statement. There are some peaty whiskeys that aren't heavily peated. Um, Oban fourteen, for example, on the lighter yeah, side o- of the peat. O- Oban, Oban, uh, Little Bay, Oban fourteen. Um, I think there's another one. Um, Bowmore is lightly peated. Um, but then you get into like, uh, I just happen to have this bottle here. You <laughs> get Ardbeg 10. That's the, that's the peatiest. And I got a bottle of Ardbeg 27, which is a lighter peat. Believe it or not, the older these whiskeys get, the peat mellows down, mellows down. And they just released a 19 year old. It's not like a commercial, but it's not. This is the stuff I drink. Uh, they just did a 19 year old peated, of course, it's all peated, Ardbeg. And that's just got a nice soft sweetness to it, uh, and I like that. I mean, that's controllable. It's it's uh, that's an enjoyable drink. You could almost I don't recommend it, but you could almost put a little splash of soda in there. Mm. What's the name of your uh, spirits book? Uh, it's called. Can I show this, please? Yeah. The Connoisseur's Guide to Worldwide Spirits. All right, the only the only book you did that I haven't read yet. Okay. Yeah. And I'll, t- and I'll tell you a story about so that cover. I designed that cover. Of course, I don't get credit for it, but it, it's, you know, worldwide. And they're trying to think of what to do on the cover. They're going to put a, you know, a bunch of bottles on there. I said, no, 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 no. I said, why don't you, the, the big shape in ice now is a sphere. You know, they cut it by hand and now they have molds for it. Sure. I said, put a glass with a sphere in there, but make the sphere a of the world. Now, wouldn't that sum it all up? And oh, oh, that's a good idea. So, the guy wouldn't get it. The the art director couldn't get it. So I went down to my uh, local uh, watering hole, and I ordered a a whiskey, 
And I said, give me a sphere ice cube. I put it in there, took a picture of it, sent that to the art director, said, that's what I want. So that's how that, that's how that cover design came about. Yeah, it's funny how we, we try to get somebody to be able to read our, our mind of what we want and can't. Read your mind. He said it out loud in English. The guy should have been punched in the face, (laughs) not sent a second chance. It's sometimes you just can't end up saying saying what you mean. Well, we're we're smoking the House of Windsor Sportsman, uh, 1980 edition uh, from the Winter Olympics. It is an uneventful um, cigar. (laughs) I'm at the end now. The tobacco pieces are coming into my mouth. I had to put it down. Way past its prime. Um, But um, is there a favorite cigar? You know, you started off Hoya de Monterey, and now here we are, um, 30, 30, 40 years later. uh, What's your go-to on a cigar? I've got a a couple of go-tos because I get, you know, you your mood changes, you know, with me, it's almost hourly, but daily, you want different ones. But um, I'll smoke anything Fuente makes. I mean, hands down. Uh, Padron, love them. They are great. Could you get? You see where my tastes have elevated to, not so much elevated, but I'm into the medium yep. heavy, not medium, medium heavy. But, yeah. Dominican, Fuente, Nicaraguan, boom. Padrones, love the Nicaraguans. Um Nestor Placentia has now started doing his own cigars. Great stuff, yeah. And, and boy, he's done three uh, different versions, and I love all three. They're so good. They're yeah. so great. And I look at my ashtray outside, and I smoke them down to the band, which typically you don't, at least I don't always do, because it gets harsher and harsher as you get closer to the band because the tobacco is acting as a filter. So it's coming stronger and stronger. Now, some smokers like that. I like consistency. And these cigars that I mentioned all have that. In fact, that's probably a common denominator of what I would like. I don't like cigars, especially that start out with a boom and whistle down or vice versa. But boy, if you know what you got the first puff out, uh, and that will be a little harsher just because you got the flame and the smoke, but then it settles down. And if you can get a consistent flavor all the way through, you know, you, it's like coasting in a, in a car. You just know where you're at, you know? Nice. Nice. Richard Carlton Hacker, thank you for writing the ultimate cigar book. And thank you for joining us on the cigar authority. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Okay. We're going to go to break. And when we come back, we're going to finally get to this cigar, part of the cigar authority care package. If you're part of it, you'll notice it had no band on it for the first time. uh, A cigar was blended like this. Also, I never welched on a bet before, but today might be the first time because Mr. Jonathan's full of shit. We're live from studio 21 podcast cafe, and you're listening to the cigar authority on the United Podcast Network. Stepping into the aging room has a new meaning at Aging Room Cigars, as Rafael Nodal has traveled to Spain, where the idea for Aging Room Solera was born. The Solera method of aging has been used for centuries in the making of wine, sherry, brandy, and rum. The method mixes different vintages, allowing them to age together. For Aging Room Solara, Rafael takes several tobacco vintages and puts them in bales, where they age together for another 12 to 18 months. This allows the tobaccos to marry for a longer period of time. At the end of the aging process, Aging Room Solara becomes a balanced and complex cigar with a fantastic price point. Aging Room Solera, it will have you calling for an encore. In a time where humidors are overflowing and retailers' shelves are on the verge of buckling, there is one brand that stands out amongst the rest. Sereno Cigar Company offers four distinct blends. The Connecticut, the Medio, Maduro, and Maduro XX, all aged to perfection. Crafted at the La Corona Cigar Factory in Esteli, Nicaragua, each artfully crafted blend comes to life by the experienced hands of master blender Omar Gonzalez Aleman and industry veteran Anthony Sereno. To create this masterpiece, a combination of hand-selected filler tobaccos from the fertile soils of Esteli and Jalapa are aged for over five years and then draped with a luxurious wrapper leaf to bring you an endlessly complex and majestic experience. A post-roll aging process of two additional years allows the blend to marry, creating unmistakable and ever-changing tasting notes that tantalize the palate, leaving you anticipating each and every drop. Visit SerenoCigars.com for a list of retailers, and you can always find Sereno Cigars available online 
online at twoguyscigars.com. Sereno, a majestic cigar aged to perfection. You've heard us talking before about the best cigar magazine in the world, Cigar Journal. You want to know what makes Cigar Journal the best cigar magazine? Cigar Journal covers every angle of the cigar world. From exclusive stories and features, insightful interviews with industry power players, detailed cigar reviews, and of course, all the latest news and reports surrounding premium cigars. We're telling you, you will be impressed. Cigar Journal has stunning images, explanations of cigar science basics this is the magazine for any cigar enthusiast or better yet passionado cigar journal covers cigars in the u.s and around the world and is printed right here in the usa you owe it to yourself to discover the world's best cigar magazine cigar journal available at your local cigar retailer and on the web at their new website cigarjournal.com That's CigarJournal.com. You're listening to The Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. Let me tell you a little bit about the Rocky Patel 15th Anniversary Cigar, or what they call the Three-Peat. Crafted in Rocky's boutique Nicaraguan factory, the 15th anniversary was released in 2010 to commemorate Rocky Patel's 15th year in the cigar industry, and it impressed right out of the gate. The Robusto and the Torpedo both scored 93 points in Cigar Aficionado, while the Toro and Corona Gorda both notched 92 points. The Rocky Patel 15th Anniversary is a robust cigar with notes of toasted spice, roasted coffee, and almonds. Rocky Patel himself has referred to his 15th anniversary as the Decade on Steroids. The 15th anniversary has also been named to Cigar Aficionado's Top 25 Cigars of the Year list on three separate occasions. Rocky's only brand to accomplish the three-peat. Rocky Patel's 15th anniversary. Rocky Patel's 15th anniversary. Rocky Patel's 15th anniversary. The La Galera Habano uses a classic wrapper on a staple cigar for a classy company. Hi there, this is David Garofalo of the Cigar Authority, and I want, no, no, I need to tell you about La Galera Habano. The La Galera Habano is an authentic cigar elaborated with the hands of the best cigar rollers of Tobacalera Palma in the Dominican Republic. Blended around an outstanding, flavorful Ecuadorian Habano wrapper, the Dominican-grown Corojo binder, and the filler made up of Peloto Cubano, Criollo 98, and Peloto de Oro, creating a medium to full-bodied, attractively consistent, and aromatic smoke that envies no other. I love this cigar. Have you tried La Galera Habano yet? Well, what are you waiting for? Available at better cigar shops worldwide is La Galera Habano. The wait is over. La Galera Habano. Justo and his father Julio Eiroa are continuing the tradition of growing authentic Corojo and now bring you Aladino. Aladino is a true old-fashioned cigar, pure authentic Corojo grown in the Eiroa tobacco farms in Honduras from the original Cuban seed of Corojo. An Aladino cigar represents the golden era of cigars in Cuba and after one light. This old school smoke will bring you back. Aladino cigars come from JRE Tobacco, a family center company who manage all aspects of cigar growing and manufacturing. This crop to shop operation is fully committed to providing you with quality and satisfaction. The premier Corojo grower in the entire cigar industry is Julio Eiroa a tobacco grower and master cigar blender who personally guarantees that Aladino will provide you the opportunity to enjoy the true authentic Corojo taste. Take this journey and be part of history in a cigar smoking experience like no other. Aladino. This is George Padron from Padron Cigars. You're listening to the Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. And we are back with our number two. Uh, we're going to go from a 40-year-old cigar to a totally new concept of a cigar that's never been done before. Welcome back, everybody, to the Cigar Authority. And this is a cigar that we put in the care package, and it's maybe the first cigar without a band that came there, so nobody knows what it is. Right. I hope they did, just didn't light it up and 
you know, Wait a ahead of show, time. a little explanation yeah. of what it is. Yeah, so tell us about the cigar bag. Well, today's second cigar is El Tayo, and it's manufactured in the Dominican Republic by Jose Dominguez. The size is a 6x50 Toro, and it features an Ecuador wrapper, Sumatra binder, and the fill is, is stems, 42% Dominican, 12% Sumatra, 16% Nicaraguan, 15% Connecticut broadleaf, 15% Pennsylvania broadleaf, 100% stems. Cigar price is uh, $14.99 for a five-pack, while a sleeve of 50 is $129.99 which is a savings of $20 or 13% off the five-pack five pack price on twoguyscigars.com. If you're too far away from a brick-and-mortar retailer that carries it, try twoguyscigars.com. That's the number two, guyscigars.com. So we have a $2 cigar here. So how is that even possible? It's possible because it has no tobacco leaves in it. It's just the stems that normally are discarded or a little bit is used in most blends. But here's a blend of a whole bunch of different stems that are wet, flattened, dried again, and then put into a blend. I was part of this thing for a few years of testing and trying this cigar because it was never done before. And the blend was very important because... It's just like blending tobacco, blending the stems. There was different things that happened to each stem of, wow, this is very citrusy. This one is very this. This one is very that. Until they got to something that was basically somewhat enjoyable or um, smokable, burnable. Right. Because as I remember from all your disassemblies, it's got a really thick binder on it. You know, yes. Because I think... They have to, so you don't have stems poking out. Yeah, and it's an unfinished foot on here so that you wouldn't actually Thank see you. right what's happening in here. Um, because the fun of this cigar is to smoke this with somebody that doesn't even know and say, I want you to smoke this cigar with me, and let's talk about it and see if you like it. And it's a whole different thing after then you know what it is, and then you say, no, I don't like it. But the first time you try with somebody, they're starting to talk about different things, and they say, well, it's interesting what, and, and no negative stuff is happening at all until later you tell them what it is, and then they say, oh, Jesus, just the So stem. you just blew it for a 1,000 people. Nice job, David. Well, there's usually a lot of popcorn talk, too, with yeah, this I, cigar. And there's yeah. one thing all the stems have in common. And we'll feel the effects of it really quick. Absolutely, <laughs> which is going to be nicotine that it derives mostly from the stem of it. So it's going to be a high nicotine. So it's part of the Cigar with Authority Care Package. Yes, I'm telling you, it's only a $2 cigar that's in there. But I think you need to experience this. This, this is like when, when we brought in um, the... Um, Agonosa Experience. Yeah. When we gave that... Actually, that's not what I'm thinking of. Um, the... the um, Connecticut Valley machine made cigar, um, the um, topper, topper. Yeah. right? There was a lower price cigar, uh, but you needed to smoke it, and you need to smoke this. You need to experience what it is. Uh, if you're not part of the Cigar Authority peer, peer package, you should be. It's twenty four ninety nine per month, and it includes shipping, and you're going to get four different cigars every single month. At the end of the month, we send them out so that you have them to smoke along with us during the show, like that's happening right now. If you want to bump it up to $29.99, uh, you're going to get a fifth cigar, and it's called the Cigar Authority Prime. You can sign up for that. Just go to the Cigar Authority. You'll see it on the right-hand side, and uh, click the button and sign up. You quit whenever you want, but you won't because uh, it's Despite this being a low price cigar, you'll see the value of what happens. Okay, let's give it a cut and light. The official cutting brought to you by Perdomo Cigars. Perdomo, the brand, while all other brands were raising prices, Perdomo cut out the federal S chip tax and actually lowered them. Perdomo Cigars, they stand for quality, tradition, and excellence. Excellence. Cut pretty easy for being comprised entirely of stems. Now look at it. Before you put the cigar in your mouth, and you're going to see wood chips, basically, it looks like, right? Mm -hmm. That's a good description. And it's ash, an unfinished yeah. foot. I had no, nothing on the cold drawer, but it's because of the, the foot. Unfinished foot, yeah. Yeah, I couldn't even get like a drawer no. off of Yeah, this is sealed pretty tightly. At the beginning, when we were testing it, they did have the 
foot opened, but it kind of gave away the story at that point. So um, another a tobacco leaf has been added to it, and you can see it's not even the same leaf that's on. It's just an added-on little cap at the end. We're going to light our cigar today with the Vertigo Puffer. The Vertigo Puffer features a single soft flame that shoots out of the side. You've got flip-out pipe tools for you pipe smokers out there. And uh, for you cigar guys that like to get every single ounce of cigar, you could use the poker for the pipe to stab into the cigar and really nub the hell out of it. The Vertigo Puffer retails for $19.99. So I got a cool little pipe, not pipe stand, cigar stand with my name on it from Mike Damari. How cool is that, right? Yeah, I, I got, got one, one too. too. It really... It's cool. It has the two guys logo on one side, our names yeah. on the other. Not for sale, but yeah. just for us. Yeah, three of us got it. Three, yeah. Somebody didn't yeah. because he had bad things to say. Because yeah. that's what he does. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Your mother brought you up wrong is what it is. <laughs> so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out Jason in our chat room. Uh, he's a regular listener. Hopefully he doesn't take offense to this. Well, well when you start off with, I'm going to call him out. <laughs> yes. So I think offense is about to be taken. He was saying at the start of the hour, he was looking forward to having a cigar with us. We just told the story of what the cigar is, and his answer was, hell no. He's not even going to try He's it. He's not even going to try it. What a shame. So What a shame. You're, you're, you're missing the whole world of, of cigars. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this a little bit geeky um, numerous times on social media. Um Tatuahi cigars tend to have a, a, a decent sized stem showing in a lot of their cigars. So does Padron, so does everybody. Right. So I'm using him as an example because he has put down that it is a major ingredient in every of cigar. Course. It's like making something without spices. Yeah. Now, it's not the only ingredient in this. Right. It's the only ingredient as filler. There's Correct. a binder. There's a wrapper. Yes. And, there's a lot of binder. And the stem. Maybe a double binder. You know, maybe you're not going to like this cigar, but stems play an important role in cigars. Of course. What I will say, so too, is... open mind. I've been able to taste the stem as a result of smoking this cigar because it's all stems. So Much I, like I, the Agonos experience, I've right? said to you before, I can taste that this cigar has a stem in it. It's yeah. there. It has not, a very not, distinct now taste. Now we're tasting... And this is what blenders do. They're tasting raw tobacco and right. things all the time by itself right. when the blenders blended this they were tasting raw stem over and over and over trying to say okay what if we put some of this in what if we put some of that in because they got to make a hint make 20 30 cigars finished each time they end up changing the thing to end up let them sit we're talking about very very aged stem a lot of work that goes into it but actually the 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 cost of the labor is the yeah. intensive thing. Yes, it's a discarded, for the most part, discarded part of it. But now the labor and work that goes into this, and it, it's much like when uh, we talked about Opus X um, with, with uh, Rich, Richard, Richard Hacker. Hacker. Um, there was a impossible thing that was happening. Somebody was making cigars with Dominican wrapper. Oh, my God, it's going to be terrible. Everybody was talking shit about it yep. until finally the thing comes out, and it was done properly. It was done like nobody ever did it before. Now people have done it since, but he was the first person to do it. Now, here's the first person to do this. Very interesting. It, it is, is very interesting, interesting to me. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Inter is it going to be Cigar of the Year? No. But is it something that has a different experience that maybe will change the way you look at other cigars? Yes. I've smoked this cigar with... Top blenders, top cigar guys in the country, it is. and they're blown away. And I have to, can I open one up? Can I look at mm -hmm. this or something? And they're, they're blown away that it was done. It's almost like this is impossible to do. Let's see if it can be done. And they did it. Yeah, I've seen more of those cigars disassembled mm -hmm. than any other cigar because yeah. everybody wants to see it, it after yeah. they yeah. smoke Skip it. Martin was one of them, couldn't figure it out, opened it up. Nick Melillo, Saka. Skip had one of his guys in the factory try to create something similar. and The, the whole, yeah. every single factory in the Dominican Republic went over to see the yeah. process of this. And will it become something? Will it become an ingredient dried out and you know right now it's it's a stem but this is a flattened stemmed and put separately does this become a sprinkled on type of thing that's used in so it? so this is a flavor that's fairly unique 
if you were to take a marshmallow today, and it's got to be the jumbo marshmallow, it can't be the little ones because you won't have enough for this. Okay. You got to lick all the marshmallow powder off and put the, the marshmallow down and go back to it tomorrow. Then you lick it one more time and just <laughs> slightly roll it through a little white pepper. And that's what this cigar tastes like. I'm just saying I love you, Ed Sullivan. <laughs> so Joe got in the chat room was trying to say, and it's definitely some interesting flavors right off the first light. Uh, Andex uh, from Andex, Andex's Cigar Lounge. It's not an actual shop. It's his house. His cigar lounge. <laughs> Which is cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Which is so cool. It's like Shed Night. He yeah. said uh, it tastes almost like an infused cigar. On the retro hail, it's very distinct. And I get notes of buttered popcorn. I still get the popcorn, but now I'm... Now I'm getting... He gets popcorn and I don't get because marshmallow. It is, it is popcorn. How do marshmallows taste like popcorn? There's, there's a similarity. You know, the popcorn balls, those are made with marshmallows. But there's some pepper notes to it, too. That's what I said. Hey, Joe Guts saying uh, cinnamon toast with grated Parmesan cheese on top. I'm going to take his grated Parmesan cheese and I'm going to turn it into Asiago cheese. Uh, double down <laughs> on it, guy. Asiago. <laughs> Double down on that. I'm not. I'm not coming up with flavors anymore. I don't get any <laughs> any props. Now the stem has a lot of nicotine in it. That's the part. So th this is a Habano wrapper that's on here. There's a Connecticut version. There's a Maduro version. Never came out, but there's those versions that that I have had. And in order to decide which one should be the one, or to to give my opinion of what it is. One day, I smoked a Connecticut, Habano, and Maduro, back to back to back. I was jittery. I was holy mackerel. Go to the horse I, track I, and place bets because you I can felt, see to the future? I had a nicotine craziness. Uh, I'm only not even an inch in, and just on the one cigar, I could feel the nicotine jitter mm. starting. Three of them I went through. Uh, I'm getting uh, nothing so far. Oh, I'm not it's saying it won't happen. It's early, but it, here's a head nothing. Up of You don't want to smoke three in a row. No. Um, they come in packs of five. Uh, would you say fourteen ninety nine for a pack of five? El Talio, T A L L O. Fun to have with your buddies. Uh, if you got four buddies, you're all smoking that cigar, and then you save one to cut open and show them at the end what it is. Um, I, I, I've done it so many times with so many people, uh, but they're usually blown away. And yeah. yes, I, I you know I, I don't want to fool you guys. I want to tell you right off the bat what's going on. Does this become the next big thing that people start incorporating or does copycats come out and other people try to do a stem cigar and, you know, these things are out there. You know, it, it's chicken soup, right? You make chicken and then there's whatever the carcass is left over and you turn it into chicken soup. You make cigars, you got the leftover stuff. <laughs> I was really, at first, I was really struggling with how the hell are you going to make this? Is he talking about a flavor? No. I'm with you now. It's I'm with chicken you. soup. When I have the flu, I'm going to smoke one of these. <laughs> it, it's the sausage of the, or the hot dog of the cigar industry. You had Jonathan at sausage. And, and, and it's handmade cigar. It's not a machine-made cigar. Listen, we just had a machine-made cigar from 1980. It was terrible. How's this? It's, Compared to that listen, cigar, this is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And this is less than $2. It's good. It is good. And I do have, uh, I've got some Nikolai Volkov chicken soup for you in the fridge for later on. I know you're a little under the weather. Can I eat that? On your diet, yeah. Yeah? It's okay. keto friendly. <laughs> All right. By the way, Ed Ryan, on your uh, rolled marshmallow comment, says that he never would have guessed that you did more drugs than Ed Sullivan. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he did. <laughs> I'd be shocked. Yeah. <laughs> I tried pot once. I didn't like it. Let's find out what's up in the cigar world with Barry Stein. It's time for What's, what's up? up in the Cigar World, brought to you by Recluse Cigars. You want to know what's up? Recluse Cigars is what's up. Voted the 2015 Cigar of the Year is the Recluse Amadeus Reserva Habano. Every Recluse cigar goes through eight, count them, eight fermentation cycles over the course of two full years. They are box-pressed and rolled N2 bar for a perfect draw every, every time. time. If you haven't done it yet, be sure to try a Recluse cigar today. Uh, in terms of national news, I got nothing. Very quietly. How about local news? Uh, two guys is sad at the passing of Seabrook regular Bill Gott. Uh, Bill. May he rest in peace. Yes, yes. You got nothing. Nothing. 
Slow week. Yeah, a little heads up before the show yeah, starts. It's, it's more, it's more you're, fun. You're responsible so. for the five minutes. <laughs> yeah. So you have to fill the time now. <laughs> All right, I'll take my clothes off. You got a mailbag? <laughs> Throw a mailbag in. Throw one in. All right. Vincenzo writes through the Contact Us page of the CigarAuthority.com a podqua- podcast question. Hello, person reading this. My name's Jonathan, by the way. Nobody knows that. Vincenzo. You see that you're completely... Richard Carlton Hacker didn't know who <laughs> no, I was. And that's the second time I've interviewed him this year. He liked your hat, though. He, he said, the man with the funny hat. What's his name? Yeah. Uh, I have a quick question regarding the future of the podcast and care package members. With the podcast nearing its end with episode 501, would that also be the end of the care package? No, we're going to send them out anyway. Without a podcast to smoke along with, are there any plans to continue the monthly care package or provide maybe insider knowledge and trivia facts about each cigar? Thank you. P.S. I have a unique first cigar story. If you are still accepting them, I will send the story in a reply to your response if so. Well, send them. If, if we stop doing send the podcast, we could just do it and include cassette tapes with the care package. Well, the only people that get the podcast are the subscribers of the can, can you make it so only certain people can see or hear the show? Yes? Wow, yeah. wouldn't that be interesting? There is no show unless, so it only goes to care pack, <laughs> But we'd still be doing the show. I know. It's yeah. not going to help us. No, it doesn't help. We're going to have to have a meeting about it this week. Yeah, because this this is, what, what, what are we at here? 496. We only have to do five more. We only have to do five more. And then that's it. You're just going to make more friggin' mailbags. I can't keep up with the mailbags <laughs> I, I have. I the have. option not to re-enlist. You don't have to be here. You don't have to be here at Nobody all. Nobody have, ever have to. This is tempting. Yeah. Which, by the, the way. 501 might be my last episode. I all right. think. Per- I think. Perfect. Episode 500. Everybody else has quit. I think episode 500 falls on a No Mr. Jonathan weekend. I'll be at the... Uh, Living Legends of Dance. I don't have that down here. <laughs> you have it in your calendar. No, I do not. Yes, you do. So you'll. We be... went over it before I bought the plane tickets. So instead of celebrating, so you will the not be here for episode five hundred. That's what I'm reading right here, Dave. That's grounds for firing. I, I've only said when episode five hundred is for a year. It's in your book. I don't, I, think, I don't think it is. After the show's over, make right, sure you we'll, go look at this. We'll go look. <laughs> You're not going to be here for episode 500. He wasn't here for episode 54, 55, right. 57, 58, 59. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, along that's, with the last few weeks in a row. Usually for anniversaries, you receive a gift, but we're giving our listeners a gift of no Mr. John. Yeah. So that would be See, the gift. I, I'm just going to keep doing it whether you guys show up or not. I mean, I got in late, so I'm still yeah. fresh. <laughs> yeah. He's got yeah. plenty of And juice when you don't left. feel like showing up, you can send Laugh Track Larry. <laughs> All right. <That> <laughs> Mr. <good>. Creep Barry out. <laughs> it's time for the matchup of the week, brought to you by VS. VS means versus, but it stands for Victor Sinclair. Victor Sinclair Cigars. Would you rather lose the ability to read? See how I put this in here? Because we had an author on the show. I'm okay with that. That's or a lose segue. the ability to speak. Read or speak. Read or speak. Uh, can I listen to audio books? I got the... You can listen. Mm-hmm. So let's hold you for last oh, while great. you're thinking about it. Read yeah. or speak. You can listen to audio books, of course, but you can't read anymore. I'm not sure how much more I have to say. Oh. Really? You've I, said... I enjoy, I've said enough. Said. I enjoy a good book now and then, but I think I've got to stick with speech. You'd rather speak. Yeah, I think you'd have to get rid of me if I couldn't talk, right? No, you don't have to. You're the producer. You don't have to talk. Yeah, on, off. There's some podcasters that don't let you speak. We could could always send you to jail for a while to pick up sign language. (laughs) All right. (laughs) That that would be helpful. I'm going to stick with speaking. You'd rather speak than read. Speak. I I like getting in trouble. and proves I don't read anyway. Has anybody ever read my reviews? Obviously, I don't spell check but, them. But I don't think you have a job if you can't read. If you didn't speak. You could write. You just can't read. How would you know what you're writing if you can't read it? <laughs> you, you didn't say. You can't read. All right. See how he does this? Text to speech. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's almost 2020. We yeah. have that capability. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, and it probably even with all the wrong words and everything, no one will notice. No, nobody will know the difference. <laughs> I have, no, he uh, doesn't spell right anyway. I can't right. read half the shit he writes. 
<laughs> yeah, I got to go with uh, lose the ability to read. I don't read anyways, so I'm not missing anything. Oh, damn. I was hoping you would give up the right to speak. But, but if you can read, you can write. You can read and write back and forth to people, but you can't speak. Speak is the answer. I think I'd miss is. being able. You can't read anything. A stop sign. You can't read anything. A menu. Who's the, right. si who's the scientist that has ALS? That he he speaks like this. Oh, the dead guy. Yeah, because we could do the podcast like that with the text of speech. But what the hell is that guy's name? Oh, he's dead now. Yeah. Whoever. He... Yeah. Stephen Hawkins. Oh. We'll do the podcast like Stephen Hawkins. I think it's a little. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a little dry. <laughs> yeah, he's typing those words, right? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Want to do an episode of that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> we'll do 502, and that'll be the end of us. Because well, let's do that on episode 500, because I won't be here for it. Be perfect. <laughs> how, how how do you do that? Is there a way to re to speak and then to come? We do the whole show and then turn it into we'll, digitized. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Oh my God! This thing is going downhill. So you're going to want <laughs> us to stop at 502 because anything after 501 is going to be us testing shit, <laughs> I, yeah, seeing how far we can keep people to keep listening. To it this. might be hard to get that out live, but yeah, I, we'll I know there is a plugin available that does robot voices. Yeah, but we need the Steve Hawkins version. Oh. Um, we'll we'll play around. We'll we'll make it work. I'd like to be Mr. T if possible. All right. So see remember that program remember that movie in, it was in the 80s and it um it was war they did a war thing that um all of a sudden the real missiles were going to go up and the, the war kid, games war games mm. and they were talking to the computer and to talk back right yeah and that was way back in the 80s right well you had night rider the, well, the car what, was able to have conversations with the wasn't car wasn't there that hal computer hal 2000 or something like that yeah mm -hmm. Okay, so now is when I'm supposed to sell the meatball is on sale, but no. That'll be probably 99.999999% ready next, next week. week. So, I think so he said that last week. He I, said no, that I last said we week. couldn't do it this week because Ed was on vacation, but I think we just got the cigars from Saka, so we can put them out. We can put them oh, together. you're blaming Saka. Uh -huh. yep. yeah, Which um, Saka gave his secret ingredients to the brulee. I don't know if you saw that video. I did see it. I didn't want to watch it because I figured he would go on forever. Oh, so no. Was... Anybody has the crib notes, feel free to share. I, I, I can share it with you. <laughs> he takes the tobacco, he ages it first, then he pisses all over it. <laughs> and that's how it gets the sweetness. He, he's the worst salesman in the world. <laughs> the worst shit sells out. We don't have any brulee to sell. He, he's the worst in the world. He I would talks say he's the best. Of, he talks people out of sales. He's the worst I ever saw. And then he says, I, I piss all over my tobacco, and he put it out there. Hmm. That's what not to do. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think it's pretty genius. Man. All right. So you didn't do the meatball thing that we had. You didn't do the what's up in the cigar world. What do you do? Here's the last chance. <laughs> it's time to take a peek into the asylum oh, from our friends shit. at Asylum Cigars. <laughs> it's time for news from the insane asylum. Odd and sometimes historic news stories that are too insane to be true. Or are they? Brought to you by Asylum Cigars. Take no prisoners. Asylum cigars are truly flavorful, medium-bodied Nicaraguan cigars with sizes ranging from 4 inches by 44 to the absolutely insane 8 inch by 80. Asylum cigars. <laughs> there was no cigar news this week, and that's not only insane. <laughs> yeah, that is insane, <laughs> and that better not be true. Uh, well, you don't, we don't have to see if you're going to end up quitting at the end of 500. We won't have to wait. How much is too much for a pussy? It turns oh, out the answer right. is five. <laughs> this is what you have. There's no cigar news. This is what he brings. How much is too much for a pussy? It turns out the answer is five. It all started when Tom was dropped off at a local hotel where he was caught on camera mating with five different mollies over a six-hour period. The romp caused ZOP to suffer from severe hydration and was needed to hook up to an IV and given antibiotics. In the meantime, the South China Pet Motel had a lot of questions to answer when people were upset their cats had been mated. The hotel offered each owner 61 U.S. dollars, an agreement to sell any kittens, which gives this story a happy ending even Robert Kraft would approve of. And that's not only insane, it's asylum. 
He's disgusting. <laughs> and we won't you're miss you when you're gone. A disturbed individual. <laughs> We're smoking the El Talio. Um, you got to get past what we told you. If we didn't tell you, I think you'd be saying, wow, this is a unique cigar. To me, salty, popcorn-y. Um, I don't know marshmallow. I'm not getting that kind of sweetness. It's on the finish. Marshmallow and white pepper. For the first time that I smoked this, the first inch, I thought the aroma was awful. But once I got past the first inch. This time? This time. But once I got past that first inch, it's almost like having a, a, a pipe. There's a very distinct aromatic aroma to the cigar. It's not going to hold a long ash. You ain't going to be doing no stacking dimes with this thing, right? No, you won't. Do you find it strong? Oh, yeah. If you didn't know what's it, happening The here, first time I smoked I, it, 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 was, it, uh, I thought, thought it was stronger. It this creeps is, up on you, though. It gets right. stronger as you go As on. you get down. Yeah. As you get down. That's when you start feeling it. At the beginning, I say, oh, no, it's a light cigar. It's nothing. It seems light to me. But I know, you know, the... How it's going to fool me is as as it get, goes on, it's going to be oh my god, this is the strongest cigar, nicotine strength strong that I've had before. Okay, let's go to break. When we come back. The Don Raphael offer of the day from last week. I'm not call happy about total this. bullshit. I call bullshit. On this. Well, we're going to talk about that. Camera we'll, court. Here we come. We're live in the studio. Twenty. You're not the judge either. Cafe. Judge, jury, and executioner. And you're listening to the Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. Let's talk a little about Rough Rider cigars. So here is where the motorcycle culture meets Cigar Nation. This badass looking cigar uses the name Rough, but delivers a smooth as silk ride each and every time. Even before lighting one, you can't help but notice it's sweet like honey flavor. Smooth and creamy, resembling slightly sweetened butter. Outstanding! The Rough Rider Cigar is so beautiful in so many ways. We're talking a premium cigar, imported, long filler cigar, but wait till you hear the price. Every cigar is in the $3 price range, that's right. Even the Churchill in the 6x60, every cigar is in the $3 price range. Rough Rider Cigars, there's nothing rough about Rough Rider except the name. Rough Rider Cigars. The following message is brought to you by Drew Estate. Drew Estate, the rebirth of cigars in the new Drew Diplomat app. Join me, Barry Stein, from the Cigar Authority on Drew Diplomat. As you know, I am quite partial to Liga Pavada number 9 from Drew Estate. So join me for a Liga and share your experience with Drew Estate. And while you're at it, don't forget to check into Two Guys Smoke Shop on the Drew Diplomat app. Drew Diplomat is now available for the iPhone and Android. To learn more about Drew Diplomat, visit DrewDiplomat.com. That's DrewDiplomat.com. You must be at least 21 years of age or older and a resident of the United States, including D.C. To be eligible for membership in this program, other terms and conditions apply. Surgeon General warning, cigars are not a safe alternative to cigarettes. Since 1903, when La Aurora Cigars first opened their doors as the first cigar factory of the Dominican Republic, they have defined Dominican cigar manufacturing. Now, La Aurora continues that innovation with La Aurora Dominican DNA, featuring an exceptional blend whose soul is the Anduyo. La Aurora pays tribute to the oldest Dominican tobacco process with a cigar that features tobacco that is part of their heritage and their DNA. The La Aurora DNA features this hard-to-work tobacco that brings the unique characteristics of strength, inspiring aroma, and sweetness that creates an exceptional smoking experience that only La Aurora can bring you. Experience La Aurora Dominican DNA with its Cibao Valley Dominican wrapper, an authentic Cameron binder from Africa with fillers from the Dominican Republic, Pennsylvania, Nicaragua, and Anduyo. Available at top retailers like twoguyscigars.com and is distributed in the United States by Miami Cigar & Company. Jose Dominguez, Jose Dominguez, Jose, Jose, Jose Dominguez. What the hell are you doing? I'm writing a commercial for Jose Dominguez. 
Well, what you should be doing is talking about how good they are. That Jose Dominguez makes millions of cigars for other people, but saves the best tobaccos and the best blend for his namesake. Jose Dominguez, not singing a song, if that's what you think you're doing. What I am doing is creating what is known as a donut. Hey, nobody's going to take away your donut. No, a donut in a commercial is when it starts with a jingle and then the information comes in and then ends with the song again. The information is the filling of the donut. Why does everything you talk about have to center around food and usually donuts? I don't know. Listen, Jose Dominguez cigars come in four great sizes and two wrappers. The mild, buttery, smooth, natural, and the slightly bolder Maduro. And every cigar is about $5. You know as well as I do, Dave, Jose Dominguez is no $5 cigar. It's worth so much more, it's a sensational value. Okay, here's the end of the donut. You ready? Jose Dominguez. Jose Dominguez. A legendary brand opens a new chapter in its storied history with the H. Upman by A.J. Fernandez. The nearly 175-year-old H. Upman brand in collaboration with storied cigar maker A.J. Fernandez bring a medium to full-bodied, sweetly balanced, and yet complex smoking experience. Boasting an Ecuador Sumatra wrapper, this cigar produces incredible aromas and nuances of sweet spices. Today, almost 175 years later, the legacy of H. Upman lives on a brand new take on an age-old brand. Handcrafted in Esteli, Nicaragua by Cigar Master A.J. Fernandez. Available in four sizes, priced under $9. A legendary brand opens a new chapter in its storied history with the H. Upman by A.J. Fernandez. Bubbles, bubbles. I'm J.R. Dominguez. Thank you for listening to the Cigar Authority. We're back, and we're smoking the Altalio by J.R. Dominguez. Here in the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, this is a all stem filler cigar, St- tobacco stems, and uh, never been done before. Here it is. I hear others have tried and failed after the fact, um, and I haven't seen anybody come out with it yet, but I believe it will happen. Somebody's going to end up copying this, uh, but it was them that, that did it. I don't know if people have tried before them. I never heard of it. I, I watched the progress of what happened here, and I thought it was very interesting. Uh, quick thank you to all those people out there that like and share our podcast. Uh, I'm seeing more and more of it, uh, especially those who are subscribing on YouTube. It helps out a lot. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you could, give us a, a rating or review on um, YouTube, and I guess on the podcast thing, you give a five-star rating. or, yep. or That's how that works there, but all helps. Thank you so much. Last week, the Don Raphael offer of the day was $20. All right, so let's talk about what it is that I did first. What did I do? I took a picture. I put it on social media. I said nothing. A headless picture. You did not do any of those things. You did not take a picture of yourself. You took a a picture of your torso. That's myself. You did say something. I said nothing. Which was, oh, check the thing. People are chatting in there, and you're chatting back to them. Not saying anything about the picture. You said something. You were supposed I to say nothing. I posted the picture and said nothing. I can, you no. didn't say I couldn't respond. We happen to have the audio, Do you have the uh, audio? Sullivan, of, of what the, the oh, offer of the you, day you, was. You set up, he set the audio up of what to, to play it, here? This was I was he, not brought into This was here for my playing pleasure. Okay. All right, I want to hear it. It's time for the Don Raphael Offer of the Day, and it's brought to you by Don Raphael Cigars. Everyone has a price. Would you do this? And if so, for how much? 20 Should bucks, I just guys. Start taking my clothes off now? It's not that. It's uh, $20. Pour a cup of water down the front of your pants and post a picture online without an explanation. Nailed it. Posted the picture, did not offer an explanation. Of yourself. 
You Other totally people totally offered an explanation by holding the cup in your hand. Ah, see, no one said anything yeah. about I had to get rid of the cup. They just said a cup of water down the front of my pants. What am I supposed to do to prove that it was a cup of water other than hold the cup in my hand? I Still, thought about we this. We didn't want you to prove it was a cup of water. I had to prove to you there was a cup of water. Why? Because you would have said, oh, that wasn't enough water. I, I thought about that. So I got the cup, poured it down the front of my pants, held it, you, snapped the picture so you could see the size of the cup and know how much it was. Oh, I wanted, full eight ounces, I wanted people to think you peed yourself. Yep. You didn't Not, say that. You didn't say give people the uh, impression that I urinated in my pants. You said pour a cup of water down the front of my pants, which I did. You owe me 20 and, bucks. And, and post a picture of, of yourself. Which I did. No. There wasn't a picture of yourself. Who was else was posing for that picture? I have no idea, but your I brother. can't see a picture of your face, so I don't know what you... You didn't say my face had to be in it. It's bullshit. I'd, I'll burn the $20 before <laughs> I give it to you. I'll burn it first. Can we? I never welched in a bet in my life. Can we I'd, have some sort I'll of poll on the website, Barron's, this week, whether or not Dave owes me the money, because I adhered to the letter of... The no. agreement. What a scam. Is your sister going to vote 200 times like she tried that one time a couple of years ago? She might. <laughs> <laughs> no promises there. What a scam job. The cup in your hand was the explanation. Yeah, that's the... Ac- Plus, he responded you as said, people wrote in. say nothing. You did I not said say nothing. You, but you, pic- ty- you type something. A picture is worth a thousand words. By having the cup in your hand, you said a thousand words. Plus, he responded. People wrote on there and said, oh, you got $20 here, and everybody's responding to all the stuff, and you responded to them. I just like. Oh, he, D- Dave better right pay here. me for this, or whatever he said on there. What did you say? Uh, what, what was people your People are saying things that they, they, they you should people pay People are saying, up. I want to know what you said. I'm looking for it. He better, he better pay me for this. Uh, well, that's saying something. Come to think about it, I have a lot of problems with this and don't believe it lived up to what was said, which is what you wrote. And I wrote, David, I followed the rules to the letter. I did not explain anything. You said something. That's bullshit. You're, you said something. Even Skip Martin says you pay me. I'm not doing it. I'll, I will, for the first time in my life, I will burn a $20 bill and give him nothing. <laughs> Somebody in the chat that's room that's a scam. Says that uh, Damari deserves the $20 because he did it right. He did. Mm. He did drop a. He ruined the whole thing. So then he did it, <laughs> and then it, then I then I got a thing when I went home. What's this thing of everybody peeing themselves <laughs> and doing this thing? Is this a new thing? What I want people to do that that back me up is pour some water down the front of your pants and post a picture of it at hashtag I'm with Mr. J. Nobody will do that. Don't worry about it. They don't even know who you are, as as we found out today. In <laughs> Richard the show. Carlton yeah. Hacker doesn't. That's fine. So I'm not paying. You don't deserve it. You scammed the, the thing. I I'm scammed not nothing. It. I followed it to the letter. Next week. You need to frame your, your, your offerings in a better way. No, I have to worry about somebody that's going to figure a scam way out of this. There was no scam, scam way. way. No b- big deal to do that. It wouldn't have hurt you anything to just do it the right way and do it. But you said, no, I'm I did do it the right way. I poured the water down my pants. I showed you the cup. What more could I have done? You don't even believe that. You feel like you pulled a fast one, I, and you're going to for twenty up, bucks. The jury finds in the favor if it was a hundred dollars. You're not the jury. All right. <laughs> I want a poll on the website, and I want people that vote to be able to no, vote no on Monday. Poll, no poll on the website. One hundred dollars this week. You want a hundred dollars? No. Here's the hundred. I don't believe you'll pay it. Drink an entire bottle of extra strength laxatives on the show next week. You drink the bottle of it here. And you don't have to shit yourself after. You can run to the bathroom or whatever, but you drink the whole bottle right here next week. $100. I'll give it to Ed in advance. Oh, so Ed's the one that we trust now because he's saying you shouldn't pay give me it either. Give Barry. Who else can you, you don't trust? You don't trust anybody. I don't trust any of the three of you because I, I believe the conspiracy has been proven. Back before Christ was born, money used to say in Ed we trust. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> How big's a bottle of laxative? It's a, the regular thing you buy in the in the store. It's a fleet thing, and you mix it with water, and you drink the whole thing. That's like a gallon. No, it's not a gallon. It's 16 ounces or whatever. It's let not me, even let a lot. A, let me do a little research on this <laughs> before I say whether or not I'll do it or not. Barry, you in? I got the furthest drive home. I'm out. You ain't, you ain't going to make it home, by the way. Yeah. This is going to be... 
I'm going to skip it. And you're going to let us know next week? Are you here next week? I'm here next week. Really? <laughs> you're not, not here most most weeks. Hey, for a little I'm, while. We'll I'm bringing able- it in, and if you're going to do it, we're going to do it right on the show. Oh, you <laughs> pick the laxative. For a little while, you'll be able to say, Jonathan's not full of shit. Right. I mean, there's been times when you I could have used it. You want 100? You got 100? And here it is on the show, and... It needs to have well, a nice flavor to it. I'm going to have to try a couple. It's lemon. The flavor is lemon. Ugh. They don't have strawberry? No, it's lemon. Why does it always have to be lemon? I don't know. I've done it before, so it's not uh, the Fleet Olympics. We could all do it, and we could turn it into a contest and see who goes first. So that'll be after episode 501 when we really get into the shit. Huh? <laughs> I see what you did there. Here we go. <sighs> All right, go ahead. Following message was submitted through the contact us page of the cigarauthority.com. And Jordan writes, please tell me it's a joke. You guys are stopping the podcast. Aloha, brothers. I hope all is well. I've heard you mention way too many times that after 501 shows, you are thinking about stopping the podcast. Thinking about it. Thinking. I'm truly hoping I'm missing the joke on this one. I'll be okay if I'm that dense. Ha ha. You really cannot stop doing the show. Every Saturday and every Wednesday, I listen to you religiously. And even more importantly, you guys have the absolutely best information and most pertinent updates on what's going on in the cigar industry. No one else does what you do, not even close. Please just let me know if it's a joke. Thanks, and keep up the great work. Seriously, don't stop. Mahalo, Jordan. Mahalo means... Mahalo has a dual meeting. Hello, goodbye. Or oh yeah, they do this. Oh, no, they say mahalo. Is, yeah, hello. Uh, Aloha's hello, goodbye. Don't know what mahalo means. I've but. seen people do this and say mahalo. If Barry drinks the lax, will he stop talking out of his ass for a small amount of time? Was it this? Uh, I, no, I don't know. Yeah, you got it. It is this, right? And it's to expre- it's to express gratitude. Uh, there we go. You ever been to Hawaii? No. Hawaii, no. I've drank laxative before, but I've Ed never been Sullivan's to Hawaii. Ed Sullivan's done it all. It's too far. It's far away. Very far. Never too done. far for you to go. It's there. too far away, and, and there's there's like 19 of the most deadly things on that island that'll just kill you. Florida's like that, too. Ever since I saw the Brady Bunch, I'm too scared to go. To oh, Florida. that was scary. I never saw that one. It's the idol with the spider. and Yeah? yeah. Afraid to go. Uh El Talio. Giant snakes. Start, starting to build up. It's not it's bad, starting right? starting to build up. Rudy's saying, as somebody who smokes a lot of bundle cigars, he is liking this cigar. However, he is not getting popcorn. No. Really? Because it's marshmallow <laughs> rolled in white pepper. <laughs> no, it's salt and pepper popcorn. Salt and pepper on the popcorn. There's way more sweetness than that. You're not giving it no, the sweetness. I'm not sweetness getting sweetness. I'm looking for credit. the marshmallow sweetness. I'm not getting it. Oh, this sweetness, Jerry. The sweetness. So what if we end up changing the podcast after 501 and doing it the liquor on, authority? on a weekday, say a Thursday night, a Friday night, so people could listen live and things that would be home from work and stuff instead of Saturday. We get our biggest boost on Mondays and Tuesdays. We get the biggest amount of people. Yeah, but work. I think if we did it on Wednesday, we would get our biggest boost on a Thursday. It's just... The podcasts don't get automatically downloaded until the next morning. Then we would get the biggest boost on Sunday if your premise were correct, which it isn't. People listen on Monday because they're going to work. They live their life on the weekend. They're on their way to work on Monday. Okay, so we do it on Wednesday. They're on their way to work on Thursday. Therefore, the boost will be on Thursday. See, now you're starting to make sense. <laughs> Barely. So what do you think about a Thursday night I'll do podcast, I'll do, Friday night podcast? I'll do whenever. It's only five episodes, whatever you want. Not now. I'm saying after. <laughs> oh, <all right. laughs> I'm going to end after. up with so many mailbags after that comment. Jesus. Well, I think what will happen, depending on the time. We used to do this at 10 a.m. Right. At the very beginning. Right. But if you, for example, pick Thursday, pick a time, 6 o'clock, right? Okay. Now it's 3 o'clock in California. That's not good. They'll be working. Yeah. So you'll probably attract some people, and others will fall off. So it's a net watch zero now. Yeah, we don't know. I don't know. Maybe our uh, loyal live people should let it us know when's the ideal time to do the show, or is this the ideal time? I don't know. Well, and for an audience, I mean, we got a good audience today. Yeah. 
because it's Saturday and they're not working. Right. And as winter comes, it gets busier and busier, and the summer gets slower and slower. Football season Thursday will kill us because uh, there's a Thursday night football game. Since when did they start that stuff? Monday night football, uh, Thursday night football, Saturday and Sunday Sun night Thursday football. Thursday's five or six years now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's been my entire life Thursday night football has been a thing. Five years? Wow, you look old for your age. You, you, Five years? He just Googled something that he was sure of and realized that he is an idiot, and now he's the expert on how long Thursday night football has been going <laughs> Thursday on. Thursday night football started in uh, 2006. Like I said, most of my life. It was part of the NFL's uh, run to the playoff package. 2006. Games uh, broadcast on Thursday and Saturday. 15 years? That's a long time. For you, because Cause I'm not you're old. younger, 15 years, the shirt is 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even joking. He's not. All right, let's get to the classic day in classic history, brought to you by Classic Cigars. It's time for This Day in Classic History, brought to you by Classic Cigars. Classic Cigars are now the most affordable cigar brand in America. With prices as low as $1.50, this cigar has something for everyone. The Classic Connecticut is light and smooth. The Classic Maduro is bold, but never overpowering. The Classic Cameroon sits somewhere in between with hints of sweetness. And the Classic Cuban is a real knockoff of the taste and flavors from old-time Havana's. Classic cigars are sold in cost-saving bundles of 20 and sold in five great sizes, ranging from $1.50 to $2.25 per cigar, which makes Classic the most affordable, premium, handmade cigar in America. Classic cigars. Which is not true anymore. We're smoking the most low-priced, premium cigar in America right now. Does it count as premium if it's made with stems? Maybe not. Hmm. Maybe not, but it is a handmade. Today's October 12th. Ed Sullivan's our champion. I don't uh, think so it's I, Barrett's. I won last week. I've been oh, you horrible did. lately. All right, we're going to start with you, Barry. John Garofalo, my father, was born in Boston, Massachusetts, the first of the Garofalo family born in the United States. He was a Korean War vet, later a U.S. postal worker. He died in 1998, but he was born today. What year? John Garofalo, happy birthday, Dad. I'm going to say 1943. 43. 1925. 25. 1901. 01. Somebody has two points. Ed Sullivan, 1925. Yes. I, I studied the history of the Garofalo family. Yeah, as you should. Wow, two you points. just sounded like Laugh Track Larry there for a second. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Over to Ed Sullivan. Luciano Pavarotti, Italian opera tenor. O Giorgio, three tenors. He died in 2007, but he was born in Italy today. What year? Luciano Pavarotti. 1948. 48. 1910. 10. 1935. 35. Somebody has two points. Barry Stein. Damn it. 1935. Okay, we're over to Mr. Jonathan with no points. The guy with the funny hat. This is, by the way, this three and one tiebreaker. Uh, it's over to Mr. Jonathan. You need two points and exact to tie, or else we go to tiebreaker for these other guys. Executive Mansion is renamed the White House today. What year? The Executive Mansion, as it was called, was renamed the White House today. What year? I'll give you an extra point if you tell me who the president was that renamed it. So you got a chance here. It was uh, 1880. It was Taft. 1880 at Taft. 1838. No idea. I'm going to go 1867 and Lincoln. Without going over, we got one point for Mr. Jonathan. It's 1901, and it's Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt in 1901 becomes the White House. So, we have a tie, so we're going to continue. Jonathan has one point, Barry and Ed have two points, so you can make a comeback here. Damn right. He's really out, but it doesn't matter. You're out. 
Hey, it's a tiebreaker <laughs> for the people who what have the tie. same number of points. That's not how this game has ever been played. You can't change the rules just because you... So I can't make sensible rules. Correct. All right. No, Dave's closest the without going down, over hasn't made sense for eight years. Pour the water down your pants, take a picture of your neck down, Dave, I see, and, and write in it and explain what's, what you're I doing. I see exactly, exactly, by the exactly rules. what you're talking about, there we Dave. Go. All right. It's bullshit. It's, it all goes full circle. Barry Stein, lost to you for the championship. Boston Celtics guard Chris Ford scores the first three-point basket in NBA history on the fourth quarter, 114-106 versus Houston at the Boston Garden. The game marked the debut of rookie Larry Bird and future basketball Hall of Fame Magic Johnson makes his debut in the Los Angeles Lakers at the San Diego Clippers when the Lakers win 103-102. to First three-point shot, the first game for both Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. All happened today. What year? 79. 79, he says. 82. 82. 1967 for two 67. points. 67. Somebody has two points. Barry Stein and the win. Well, Barry you, Stein, 79. You, you gave him his question for the <laughs> tiebreaker. Yeah, it was it was loaded for him. I think so. He gets it. He gets I had eighty two written down until you say Larry Bird's rookie. Here. There we go. So it, a lot of a lot of hints there. I don't follow hockey, so I wouldn't know who Larry Bird is. There we go. And my cigar stayed lit, so the stems stay lit. Hmm. That's a good thing too. Which is surprising me. I thought this would be a cigar when we first smoked it. That would constantly be. I put to it down that that whole uh, ridiculous segment. I put it down, <laughs> and it stays lit. And the uh, chat room is uh, chimed in, and they say that it should uh, stay on Saturdays, that they enjoy starting their weekend with the Cigar Authority. If it's not broke, don't fix it. And then there was one person that said Wednesday at 6 would be the best. It keeps the weekend free for college football and family. And both Barry and Jonathan start their weekend on Thursday anyway, right? Both, both True. Start. Well, no, nah, I work on Friday. Is that what you call it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually call it stealing a paycheck, but <laughs> yeah. uh, I didn't say that out loud. So we got the after show coming up. Uh, the after show is a podcast only if you're not subscribed to the Cigar Authority podcast because you're either doing this on Facebook or YouTube. You need to subscribe to the podcast to get the after show. Um, and we have actually, uh, I have nothing prepared at all for the after show. But Don't worry, I have this entire book of mailbags okay. that we can... Make a dent in. All right, we'll, we'll go to that. So uh, next week, Robert Wright is into cigars and music. Um, he will serenade us with both his sax and cigars and a king's treasure. So until then, you've been listening to The Cigar Authority on the United Podcast Network. And if you've learned nothing in the last two hours, always remember to keep the lid end out of your mouth. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts, guests, or callers of this program do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe, the United Podcast Network, its partners or affiliates.